So the fall is finally here. The weather is cooling down. You are wearing your jeans and your jacket to the lake. Those bass are moving shallow to feed up for the winter time and you are catching more bass than ever before. And one of the ways you can catch those in the fall is on top water. But with fall top water, there are so many questions you may ask. You can ask where to throw the top water, what types of top waters to throw, how fast to move your top water, how many colors to throw in your top water, everything. We're gonna answer all your questions today. So let's talk about it. So my name is Tyler Anderson. I run this channel called TRF. And of course, my goal on these instructional videos is to help you guys become better bass anglers yourself. And so the topic of today's video is going to be fall topwater. Now, topwater is, especially in the South, good 10, 11 months out of the year, you can throw a topwater and have success. But especially during the fall, I find that topwater is very, very successful. And that's for a myriad of reasons, which we're gonna talk about in today's instructional. But the first thing we're gonna talk about is basically the the presentation of a top water why it is good so the reason why top waters are good in the fall is because they represent a forage now if you guys don't know what the word forage means i'll have a description down here on the bottom i don't know an exact def dictionary definition but in the bass fishing community forage is basically any sort of food source that a fish will use to grow, to live. I have people DM me on Instagram all the time asking me, hey, how do I fish my pond? And I ask, the first question I always ask is, what is the forage? So what are the fish eating? Are they eating bait fish, shad, bluegills, or, or, or gills, panfish, or anything else in a category called other? And so I'm gonna go through all four of those categories, and those categories are gonna kinda carry with us the rest of this video when talking about presentation, location, baits, and all that jazz. So let's get started. Before we even begin talking about the lures that I throw to imitate these forage, I'm gonna talk about the main forage that everybody in the country has that their bass are eating, starting with bait fish. The term bait fish and shad, oftentimes in my videos, you guys will hear me confuse them. Uh, they're not the same thing. They're definitely different. I just call everything shad here in the South. But bait fish, I would classify as any minnow style uh, fish so any sort of like more slender type thing that a bass eats under three inches i would call that bait fish so that can be anywhere from really small shiners to your, your standard minnow that's about this big that you know you see in your highland lakes here in texas and oklahoma and then of course working your way all the way down to glass minnows those tiny little minnows you see in the water and you see a hundred thousand of them in a little ball swimming around i would classify that as bait fish now category number two i'm going to classify as shad shad is not as pervasive in the north as it is in the south you guys don't have as much shad in the north as we do down in texas but shad as i would say is anything over three inches so that's your thread fin that's your herring that's your gizzard shads that's your big shiners that you have down in florida like in okeechobee that's what i would classify as shad so of course bait fish under three inches shad over three inches and of course there's tons of species i'm missing out but i just feel like those are not really necessary for the purpose of this video and then category number three is going to be uh, panfish. And so what I mean by that is every species of bluegill and every species of crappie. That kind of falls under one category because those are not in the slender bait fish type of shape. They are more, as you guys have probably, I'm guessing many of you have caught tons of bluegill and crappie in your lifetimes. They are much different shape and so they require a different presentation as well. And then the fourth category I would say is everything else. So in that category you have uh, bugs, rats, snakes, um, birds, frogs for sure fit in that category. And usually category four is, is forage that you don't see bass eating as often. So you may find a specific lake or pond where those bass are eating forage like that, but I think majority of the time bass are eating ones, uh, the forage in those first three categories. Oh, and crawfish. Crawfish are also in, uh, in the category four. Now tip number two that I have for you guys moving off of that forage is matching the hatch. You guys hear bass fishermen talk about this all the time. I wanted to finally clarify what this means. It means matching your bait to exactly what is hatching. The term hatch is usually used with eggs for fish or for bugs. It is basically you're matching whatever those fish are eating. You can say match the forage. It doesn't rhyme, but it still works. And that's really what it means, that match your bait to the forage. But of course, you can't match your bait to the forage if you don't know what your pond, lake, river, what type of forage that has. So I get so many messages every week asking me how to fish certain bodies of water, and I've never been to those bodies of water before, so I can't give an adequate answer for how to fish those unless I know exactly what type of forage those lakes have. Now, this tip here applies to not just topwaters, not just fall topwaters, it applies to every bait all year long. 
Uh, this is, I feel like this instructional is kind of being more based on forage than the topwaters. In order to find out what those fish uh, bite on lure-wise, you have to find out what they're biting on actual real forage-wise. And the only way to do that is to use Google and to ask around. Uh, DMing me on Instagram isn't really going to do you guys any good because I would just use Google or I would ask around. So you guys have local tackle shops, you have people at the boat ramp. So uh, if you guys are confused as to what the fish are eating, make sure you guys are, are doing your research and asking people around you uh, what type of uh, forage those bass are keying in on. Because when I first fished in Minnesota, I thought for sure they had shad up there. Come to find out they don't. So I did catch a few big bass on shad type lures like a square bill, but actually those more often represent a crappie than they do a shad in, in most parts of Minnesota. So really everywhere that you go in the country is gonna have different forages and you have to be familiar with exactly what they have so you can match those. So moving on towards the fall time in specific, where do you find these types of forages, like I mentioned the four categories, in your pond or lake? I don't wanna alienate lake anglers, I don't wanna alienate pond anglers, I'm gonna to try to give tips in all the instructional videos that can apply to both of you guys. When looking for forage uh, in the fall, the one thing you're gonna pay most attention to is water temperature. Of course, in the fall, as you get closer to winter, the water temperature is naturally going to get colder with the cold fronts and cold nights that you have. But I hate giving a specific water temperature level for once the water gets here, the fish start biting this thing, because across the country that varies. So in Texas, I think I read in my graph earlier, the water is still like 84 in October. So I would say the water temperature in the fall really varies based on where you live in the country. Uh, but for me in Texas in the south, I think that fall water temperatures are the 60s and 70s. Once you get into the 50s, I would consider that to be winter temperature, at least for us here in the south. Maybe in the north in Missouri or something, the, the 40s is your winter temperature. So like I said, as soon as the water drops below 80 into those mid 70s to mid 60s and especially low 60s, that is when fall fishing will really begin. In terms of the bait fish and shad category, the, the three three inch and under, you will see that the water cools down and those bait fish will gather together and they will move to the back of the creek. Of course, that'll be a different water temperature for every lake, for every region of the country. But like I said, the 70s and especially 60s, those, those bait fish will move to the back of the pocket and the bass will follow them there. As the water drops to the low 60s and 50s, those bait fish will move back out to the main lake and will sink down in the water column oftentimes suspend around marinas. And so when you are looking for bait fish, of course, using your electronics and using your eyes are very important. If you don't have electronics and you just have your eyes, use the heck out of them. God gave you two for a reason. And so the way to find out where fish are feeding on bait fish is to literally look around. You'll oftentimes see slicks. So it's a little oily top of the water that's usually put out by a school of bait fish. You may see fish school and all over bait fish. Make sure you guys are using your senses to find those bait fish around you. Now I'm gonna kind of lump shad into that category as well. Shad do oftentimes school up. Gizzard shads, not as much. Uh, threadfin and, and herring, those do uh, gather together pretty well. But we don't have those in Texas. We just have uh, gizzard shads and, and, and bait fish. So I would say the shad also move to the back, but they're not gonna be as migratory in a group. They're more gonna stay kind of solo. Now panfish, as always, they're basically cover-oriented fish. So you're never gonna find a school of bluegill kind of roaming a gravel bar. That, that's, that's rarely where bluegill hang out, especially in the south. They love to hang out around trees and around docks and, and grass and that sort of thing. And so in the fall, your tactics for finding those don't really change. Um, but of course, as the water gets colder, the first forage species to head deep is going to be your panfish. Your bluegills and your crappie, as a matter of fact, I don't even know a time when crappie are shallow besides spawning in like, I think it's like February or March whenever crappie spawn. Um, I think for the majority of the top water in the fall, it's gonna be focused around bait fish. But if you can find an area where bass, especially shallow grass, lily pads, that kind of thing, where bass are feeding on bluegill, you, you verbally hear the bluegill popping, bass are feeding on them. That is an excellent place to throw top waters in the fall, but you can't do it too late. Those bluegill eventually, once the water gets too cold, they will head out deep and that bite will be done. In category four, the others, of course, this is our regional. So I can't tell you that your fish are gonna eat frogs when the water hits 74. It's really all regional, so of course, talk around uh, the area. There's not gonna be a top water that uh, imitates crawfish because those are not 
the type of bait fish that are on the top of the water column. So I say frogs, rats, and snakes and bugs, especially bugs for you northern smallmouth guys. That is really going to be where you find a lot of your success in the fall is when you can find areas where the bugs have fallen out of the trees, covered the water, basically may mayfly hatches, um, all that kind of stuff. That is where you're going to find success with the other category in the fall. And there's really no water temperature I can help you there. It's basically uh, figure it out for yourself. So now it is finally time that we talk about what type of top waters I like in the fall. Hopefully you guys have stuck with me at this point. If you have, please drop a like below and of course drop a comment if you guys enjoyed it. One thing you guys have to know about me as a fisherman is that I'm a very fundamental type guy. I don't have a gajillion types of top waters. I don't have a gajillion colors of top waters. I'm basically five, six, seven types of top waters is all that I throw throughout the year. And every single one of those has its place in the fall. There's not a specific top water that I find works best in the fall. Uh, of course, in the summertime, I find that a, a spook and a frog work the best out of all the top waters. In the springtime, especially a frog and a popper. In the fall, all top waters have some kind of play. And so I'm gonna talk about the four categories. I'm not gonna go into crazy detail about all sorts of different types of top waters, all sorts of brands, all sorts of changing out your hooks. I'm a meat and potatoes guy. I grew up in Texas catching big bass in dirty water. And so one thing that I love is just keeping things simple. I don't think there's any reason to throw uh, three different types of walking top waters because they have a slightly different uh, knock or a slightly different uh, tone of the, of the lure. I think if the fish is in the area, he's gonna eat. And we have pressured fish here in Texas. Uh, in other states and other, especially private ponds, you guys can afford to throw whatever type of top waters you want. Here, if I can find success fishing my meat and potatoes type of way, which basically is my way of describing myself is pretty simple, then you guys across the country can fish whatever top waters you want as well. As long as I mentioned you are matching the hatch and throwing them in the right areas. So starting with category one, bait fish, there's really only two types of top waters that I throw to imitate the very, very small bait fish. And that is any sort of small chopping type lure. So we have, you know, the Whopper Plopper and the, the Berkeley Choppo, whatever other brands are out there. Uh, and then you have the Popper. Now, I like to keep things very simple. I am almost always throwing a popper for these fish that are schooling on bait fish in the fall because it is so versatile, especially a small popper like this. Because with a popper, you're able to cast it out there. Usually it has a good weighting system, so poppers cast really well. You are able to chug it, make some you know, noise, spit some water if you want to. But the great thing about a small popper is that you can walk it. So if you have the right rod action, if you have the right rod uh, build for a topwater and you have the good wrist action, you are able to walk a topwater popper just like you would walk a topwater walking bait. And so 90% of the time in the fall, if I see fish are feeding on little bait fish, I am throwing a popper. It is as simple as that. There are times, like I mentioned, when I do throw uh, a smaller chopping bait or a tiny little striking. I love the sugar buzz. I'm putting a little grub on the back of the sugar buzz, uh, an awesome way to catch some of those schooling fish. That is if you want to cover water. Most of the time in the fall, I I'm more, I'm more target-oriented and making long casts, and that is where the popper comes in handy. Now, moving on to tactic number two is shad. Here in Texas, bass love to feed up on big shad. And so if you're gonna properly match the hatch, you have to throw big things. And so most of the time I'm throwing a regular sized Strike King Sexy Dog. But here in the fall, I love throwing a giant size. Now Strike King didn't have a version of, a, a larger version of a spook until recently. Now they have the Mega Dog. And I love this thing. This thing gets basically every quality of fish. It gets your one to two pounders, but it also calls fish up from really deep water, especially in those clear water lakes. So uh, you guys have kind of known my channel the past few years as being a shallow water, dirty water channel. Because I live in College Station, I fish Rayburn, Toledo a lot. But I did grow up in clear waters of Austin, Texas on Lake Travis, where calling fish up from deep water, I'm talking 10, 20 feet on top water, is not un uncommon, not unheard of. And a top water like this, that is the same size as the gizzard shad they're eating, is a great way to catch those big bass. So in the fall, do not be afraid to throw a big top water that matches the exact forage you are using. Uh, you may get less bites, but I guarantee the bites that you get are going to be bigger bass if you just commit to that. If you do want to uh, compromise a little bit and not throw a bait this big, you can throw, of course, a regular size sexy dog or a bigger sized popper. I know a lot of other YouTubers have talked about a bunch of different brands, a bunch of pencil poppers. I haven't messed around a whole lot with that because I have success with the ones that I use. And in my case, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so I basically stick to uh, the big walking baits, the big poppers, and occasionally a big wake bait, usually 
basically in the form of a swim bait. So I have a few swim baits in here from Piz Customs that are awesome, awesome wake baits to catch big bass uh, when they're cruising around, eating big shad, looking to feed up for the winter. Now, category three, panfish. That one is really where things change because a panfish doesn't look like this and a panfish doesn't act like this. It doesn't walk back and forth. And so most of the time when I'm fishing for panfish, I'm throwing frogs or a buzzbait. Now the reason why a frog style lure, these are the Strike King popping perch here, it's still a frog style lure. The reason why that works so well is because panfish are not very fast or very migratory creatures. So most of the time, uh, bass that are feeding on panfish, just like I talked about with the popper a little bit, is they need uh, something a little bit slower. So if bass see something moving really, really quick, they may eat out of aggression, but those are not gonna be the ones that are eating bluegill. Most of the time, your bluegill eating ones are going to be eating a frog style lure or a slow moving buzz bait. And the reason for that is because, like I mentioned, the profile is bigger. A bluegill and a crappie have a bigger body profile and so you have to imitate that profile. This does not look like a bluegill. So I like to keep it really, really simple, especially with colors. I like to go black and blue for my, for my buzz baits and I like to go white if it is a super high cloud day and dark if it is a cloudy day. And so for panfish, that's all that I do for my top waters. I also have a buzz toad. This is the striking buzz toad. And this one is great for those fish that are eating uh, panfish, but you don't have the uh, liberty of throwing a buzz bait. So let's say that you have a lot of high wind Buzz baits are incredibly hard to throw and win, and so that's where the buzz toad comes in handy. And so, of course, category four is other. And that's gonna come down to all your crazy lures, your rat lures, your snake lures. Uh, of course, the, the frog lure imitates a frog as well as it does a bluegill. I would say, though, that the majority of the time when you are throwing a frog-style lure over pads or over grass, you are imitating a bluegill and not a frog. So I'm not gonna waste y'all's time with a bunch of gear reviews, I, you know, the rods and reels. I will have them linked below as well as all these baits in the video description below. Uh, basically, for top waters, I keep it simple. I throw anything from a seven foot to a seven six. Uh, it's medium heavy for all of them and that's across the board. Uh, I don't mess with uh, monofilament leaders. Most of the water I fish is dirty. Uh, I've heard a lot of YouTubers talk about using a mono leader because of the walking bait. The hooks will catch your line maybe three or four times a day that I've had it happen. If you learn to walk your bait right, it shouldn't be catching every cast. So I usually stick to straight braid unless the water is gin clear and then I'll put a monofilament leader. But the majority of the time your top water is an aggressive strike, not a visual strike from the bass. Now, when to stop throwing top water? That's a question to ask. And that question is answered by, it's up to you. There are many times that in my life that I've thrown top waters uh, seven, eight months of the year because it gets really cold. We have really cold fall. The fish just don't bite top water well. And then I've had times when we have a super warm fall, super warm winter, and the fish bite top water basically 11 months out of the year. And so it really depends where you live, what type of forage your bass are eating, and how long that forage stays shallow. Because I personally believe that bass, especially largemouth, want to live shallow, they want to feed shallow, and if they have forage shallow, they're gonna stay there. If their forage moves deep, they're gonna have to move as well to survive. But I'd say that the stopping date on top water depends entirely on where you live. So that is all that I have for you guys today. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you learn something about fall topwaters. Like I mentioned, every topwater is fair game in the, sun, in the fall, and I'm sure you guys have some topwaters that you love fishing that I didn't mention. Of course, if you guys do, drop them in the comment section below. That way I, guess, that way I can try those out and uh, make some videos for you guys. Of course, my goal is to have you guys learn and become better bass fishermen, and we'll see you guys on the next episode of TRF.